All right. So the field of exoplanets is asking, what else is out there? The field of metal poor stars is asking, where did everything come from? And so when you combine these two lines of questioning, you get a very powerful tool for looking into the early universe. So this talk today has two parts, how we use metal poor stars to learn about the early universe and how we can apply this information to explore the history of planet formation. So first I want to give an introduction to metal poor stars. So uh, in the beginning, we started out with hydrogen, helium, a little bit of lithium. This stuff over time slowly began to coalesce into what would become the first proto-galaxies. So um, you have your hydrogen, helium, lithium, gas cloud, and in these gas clouds, your first stars begin to form. So the first stars are massive, they're metal-free, and they, uh, they have actually have so much ultraviolet output that they suppress star formation all around them. So in these little proto-galaxies, which we call halos, they um, usually only have one or two or a few or even no stars in them. Now eventually these stars, because they're so massive, they live very short lives and they go supernova. Um, so they expel all their metals out into the halo that they live in and also can, they can expel metals out into other, they can enrich other halos. And so this is where the second generation of stars is born. Now the second generation of star has its own uh, mysterious mass function that we don't quite know about, but 13 giga years later, most of them have uh, gone supernova and died. So if you look at the galaxy today, only about one in every 10,000, one in every 100,000 stars has a metallicity below minus two. So now I wanna talk about some of the interesting subclasses of metal poor stars. So one sub such subclass is the carbon enhanced metal poor CEMP stars, which actually make up a fairly solid fraction of the uh, percentage of metal poor stars. And so 20% um, of stars below a metallicity of minus two uh, our CEMP, and that number goes all the way up to 75% once you get the metallicity of minus four. So carbon enhanced metal pore star can also be enhanced in uh, R process and S process elements. They can be enhanced in both. They can be enhanced in uh, neither. And uh, so probably the best way to explain CEMP stars is to plot them in AC metallicity space. So we see the group one is all CMP S stars. These are binary stars where their uh, carbon and S process elements have been donated by a uh, mass transfer binary. We have the group two, which are uh, CMP no stars. And CMP no stars are just kind of your standard CMP star. They're second generation, they're third generation. They're kind of a mix of generation. Now your true second generation stars are your group three stars because these are the stars that have the incredibly low metallicity. We've got Keller star down at minus eight. We have all these stars down at like minus five, minus six, and they have extremely high uh, carbon to iron ratios. So these are your, your true second generation stars, your second and third generation stars, and your uh, mass transfer binaries. Another really important subclass is the R process enhanced stars. So these are identified by the europium content in them. 42% of metal poor stars have a europium above um, 0.3, we call them R1. 7% of metal poor stars have a europium abundance above one, we call them R2. So because these stars are so important, we actually have a big collaboration dedicated to finding and uh, exploring them called the R Process Alliance. So the goal of the R Process Alliance is to find new R1 and R2 stars to investigate the sites and the pathways of the R process. So far we have, a, oh, sorry. Yes. Stars. So, was that all the stars that are known? Yeah. yeah okay. They're quite rare. Uh, stars below minus four are just extraordinarily uncommon. I, I don't know what the number is, but it's definitely in the one in the millions. I must have been sleeping because I didn't know there was one. Oh, yeah, that was a uh, discovery in 2014 in the Sky Mapper. No. And it's Maybe. Good to, it's good to test the time. It's really. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, it's a, uh, a giant star. It is, it's, its spectrum is a line. There are no iron lines in this star. The only way we know its metallicity is through some little blips of titanium. And it has a tremendous carbon feature. How, how, how were the other groups of stars? Um, so mostly uh, good luck and photometry. So we start out with photometric estimates and then we just start going through the most likely metal poor stars and sometimes we get really lucky. <laughs> okay. 
Yeah, so the R Process Alliance, our goal is to find R1 and R2 stars. So far we have found 70 R2 stars. Uh, we had three data release papers over the last couple years. Uh, we have a couple papers detailing um, really in-depth R, R Process abundance pattern. And we've also been investigating something called the actinide boost. So in all of our R process models, whether they're from supernovae or neutron star mergers, they all produce elements uh, all the way up to um, all the way up to thorium and uranium. And we we actually have a very good grasp of how much that should be. And so we have a couple metal poor stars, maybe between five and ten, that are actually super enhanced in these actinide elements. And that's just very strange. We don't know why that is. All we can do is try to keep collecting more stars and try to figure it out. So what are the purposes of metal poor stars? What are they good for? So the key idea here is that they retain the abundances of their progenitor stars and the kinematics of their natal halos. So one thing we can explore is star formation channels. So the first generation of stars had, um, they, they were created by H2 gas cooling, which was very inefficient. It re resulted in massive stars because it's so hard to fragment them. So this was responsible for the first generation, but the first generation of stars were prolific producers of carbon and oxygen. And so ionized carbon and unionized oxygen gas cooling, along with carbon and silicate dust cooling and molecular cooling, were responsible for the second generation and, uh, and beyond. But what, what ratio of what cooling method um, you know, produced what stars is kind of an unknown. We can also study early nucleosynthesis channels. So uh, we have our process production via neutron star mergers, via supernovae, via some exotic supernovae like collapsars, magnetohydrodynamically driven jets, that kind of interesting stuff. And especially we've had some really good recent progress on uh, investigating the R process due to things like reticulum 2, which uh, Alex discovered. Alex is not here today. but. He uh, discovered Reticulum 2, which is a uh, dwarf galaxy, which is extremely enriched in our process elements. And then we also had the, the neutron star merger, which I know a lot of Carnegie people were involved with. So that was really awesome and really helpful in identifying this is actually the real source. This is where our process elements are made. So this sort of highlights a need for, um, for more R process enriched metal pore stars. Uh, and finally, galactic assembly is sort of another topic that we can explore with metal poor stars. Um, so stars that are associated with different kinematic populations can reveal accretion events, kind of like the Gaia sausage or the Gaia Enceladus. Um, they can also reveal the trajectory of smaller accreted satellites. And so for this, we just kind of need a lot of metal poor stars. So I want to introduce my first paper, um, Metal Poor Star from the South African Large Telescope. So um, in this paper, we are basically giving a data release of kinematics and abundances for 220 metal poor stars. That's uh, quite a significant <coughs> fraction of what is around right now. And so on the left, we have this uh, nice diagram of energy versus um, angular momentum. And so highlighted here, we have outer halo. This is the uh, Gaia sausage, and these are strongly bound disk stars. And then if you are somebody that works with or wants to work with salt data, this is just sort of an example of the quality of some different features. Here's the carbon G band. Here's the main europium feature, barium, strontium. Um, very good quality spectra. What's the instrument that you're using? I was talking about it. Oh, the instrument? Yeah. Yeah, the high resolution spectrograph. Yeah, HRS. So probably the second most important data product of this paper is that um, I designed and implemented an IRAF pipeline to accommodate SALT's unique double banded uh, HRS. So you, you can see pretty clearly here that there, there's two bands that you have to work with when you're doing IRAF reduction. And uh, this is because when you observe a star, you have one fiber on the star and you have one fiber on the sky. So this provides for very easy um, background reduction. So that requires a special pipeline. So I wrote it, and uh, if you want to use it, contact me. 
We also discovered several rare and some not so rare subclasses of metal poor stars, including five stars strongly enhanced in our process element, so R2 stars, 21 R1 stars, 15 CMP stars, and two unusual stars, which are enhanced in both the R and the S process, as well as carbon. <coughs> So with this information, we can sort of compare our CEMP frequencies to uh, the literature. So we found that 30% of our metal poor stars were carbon rich, which is consistent with Lee et al. We found that 52% of R1 stars and 10% R2 was also consistent with the RPA papers. And for, as for these two unusual CMPRS or CMPI stars, further investigation to, in, to obtain full abundance patterns will be necessary. So. Um, there, there's two possible scenarios where you can have a star that's enriched in carbon, R process, and S process elements. So you can have a CMP S star where, it's, um, where the star was enriched in the natal cloud with R process elements, and then a mass transfer binary transferred over S process and uh, carbon over onto it. But there's also something called the intermediate neutron capture process that looks very similar. And unless we have the full abundance pattern, we can't really tell the difference between these scenarios. So further follow-up will focus on these two stars. So now I want to talk about, uh, I want to totally switch tracks and talk about one measurement of one star instead of many measurements of 200 stars. So BD plus 173248 is a star that was first identified um, about 20 years ago as an R process rich star. A uranium measurement was attempted on this star because that was that's pretty much the most uh, difficult and extreme measurement you can make in, in spectroscopy. But they only had a signal to noise of a mere 100 at the, uh, the uranium feature, and so they didn't have the signal to noise to obtain a definite measurement. Now, we went back a couple years ago, and we got a signal to noise of 400 at the uranium feature. And so we were able to make a definitive uranium detection of this star. So this is only the sixth measurement of uranium ever made. It's the first measurement of uranium in an R1 star. And um, we also found some unusual uh, actinide abundances. Because this is the sun's R process. It goes from thorium to uranium, just like this. And you, see, and you can see that um, the thorium and uranium kind of fit the pattern, but they really shouldn't because this is an old star. And so the thorium and uranium has decayed over time. And so these blue dots, the, the former measurement, are where you would expect it to be. And the red dots, our measurement, are way higher. So we have classified it as an actinide boost star. Now here's the actual measurement. Go ahead and pick it apart in your mind. <laughs> So here's the, the one angstrom uh, window. You have this iron line and this iron line. Um, it's close to a neodymium feature. There's also some CN in here. And this is the uranium feature. Now, if we blow this up, we see that this gray line up here is where you have no uranium detectable. And we can see pretty clearly that the data does not fit this line. So what we have done is we have taken the upper and the lower limit of what fit the data and just taken the average of that value. So we report a log epsilon uh, uranium value of minus 1.45. But the, the important takeaway is that uranium is present and measurable in this star. And so finally, I want to talk about my last paper, which is uh, our process elements as a tracer of supernovae activity in uh, accreted satellites. So crucially, while kinematic can tell you that a star belongs to a uh, to, a, to an accreted satellite. The abundances combined with the kinematic can tell you more about the actual system itself that it belonged to. So key ideas here are that supernovae produce a lot of the first R process peak. They don't have the energy to go up to the rare earth, to the actinides, to that kind of stuff. So they produce a lot of first R process peak. That's strontium, yttrium, zirconium. Neutron star mergers produce little of the first star process peak, but they produce all the way up to the actinides, third peak, that kind of stuff. So assuming consistent yields from supernovae and from neutron star mergers, we can use the ratio of rare earth peak elements to first peak elements, and this can be used as a metric of supernova activity in an accreted satellite. So to sort of clarify this image, um, I'm just going to overlay my cartoon on it. This is what's happening. 
So when you take a whole subset of metal poor stars, those which are not enhanced in our process, those which are moderately enhanced, and those which are strongly enhanced, and you take their abundance pattern and you normalize it to europium so that the rare earth peak elements are the same for all of these stars, this is consistent, this is not. So the strontium, yttrium, zirconium abundances is drastically different when you normalize to the rare earth elements. So basically what we're seeing here is that when you have very high R process, such, such as uh, Alex's reticulum two stars, you have very low strontium. And when you have very low R process abundances of europium, then you end up with high strontium. So why is that the case? So this is the scenario that we lay out in our paper. If you have a very small halo and you have a neutron star merger that goes off in that halo, there's not really any place for those elements that were created to go. They stay in the halo um, at very high levels. And now because the halo is small, only one or a few supernovae can actually go off and raise the strontium level. So you end up with stars that come from this halo that are high in europium and uh, low in strontium. Now in the reverse scenario, you have a massive halo, you have a neutron star merger that goes off, it gets diluted, and then you also have several supernovae going off so that the strontium level is raised while the, europe, while the europium level stays low. So we can, in this way, we can use strontium and europium to reflect the mass of the natal satellite. And the implication here is that R1 stars come from large satellites with many supernovae and a lot of dilution. R2 stars come from small satellites with few supernovae and uh, low dilution. So this has, a, and we're still working on this part, but this has future applications such as maybe we can actually get a mass function for our accreted satellites. So, in the small satellites, you were supposing that a neutron was formed. Yes. Suppose you had a small satellite that didn't, that just had regulars. Then you would have a, uh, you had a, would have an ex extremely low europium, probably unmeasurable, with uh, some varying level of super of uh, strontium. So it would look like the big thing. That is a possibility, yes. We are still working out the details. <laughs> but we, right, right now, we're assuming that neutron star mergers are a consistent feature of these halos. It is contingent upon neutron star mergers occurring and also under the assumption of uh, consistent yields for both supernovae and neutron star mergers. So, at last, I arrive at my point. Now we've, just, now we've explored the, uh, the, the nature of the first galaxies, we've explored the first stars, we've explored the first chemical enrichment, and so it's finally time to talk about a, new, a relatively new topic, which is the, for the, the formation of planets. So when did planets begin to form in the universe? How old are the oldest planets? Is planet formation metallicity dependent? And what were the first planets like? So I just want to briefly go over the two models of planet formation, core accretion. You start with your, your dusty disk. You, uh, you move up into to pebbles. Pebbles accrete into planetesimals. Planetesimals accrete gas and more pebbles until they become planets, essentially. That's the, the big picture. And disk instability, you start with your protoplanetary disk, you have a gravitational instability, you end up with a gas giant. Now to contrast these models, the core accretion model uh, has, predicts many planets on short orbits, uh, it's very successful at explaining planets, and crucially it has this metallicity floor at a metallicity of minus 1.5. The disk instability model has, predicts a few giant planets on wide orbits, it has not been as, as successful at studying uh, in-depth uh, planet system, and it does not have a metallicity floor. So how can we validate the predictions of these models? Did one, was one prevalent in the early universe over another? And is there a metallicity floor? And if so, where is it? Clearly, we need planets at low metallicity to figure this out. But this is the NASA Exoplanet Archive. And this is how many uh, known planets we have at low metallicities. So below a metallicity of minus 0 0.5, we only have 31 planets as of November. A large-scale survey of metal-poor stars to, so that, that, 
together with a large uh, light curve database is clearly necessary. So this which is why I'm introducing Seamstress, the search for exoplanets around metal poor stars with TESS. So here's our overall strategy. We want to get a lot of metal poor stars. We cross match with TESS, inspect the light curves, identify planet candidates, obtain observing time for vetting, we measure, and then um, finally we will work with modelers to understand the composition and the formation scenarios. So that first step is to actually find it to start with a large sample of metal poor stars. So Ani Chidi of MIT used the SkyMapper Southern Survey to estimate photometric metallicities for over a quarter billion uh, stars in the Southern Hemisphere. This work is in prep. And out of this sample, 35,000 turned out to be metallicity below uh, minus 0.5 and dwarves as well and bright. So TESS takes images every 30 minutes of large portions of the sky at once. Uh, we only used the 30 minute cadence. We did not use the two minute cadence. And it has light curve for all bright stars in the southern hemisphere. Uh, it's currently working on the northern hemisphere. This archive is publicly available through MASS and through the, um, the Python applet Eleanor, which was cross-matched with a, uh, so we, we took, we did not use Eleanor, but we cross-matched um, on each ED's metal poor star catalog with TESS, and this re resulted in 28,000 stars. So Chelsea Huang of MIT ran the uh, box least squared algorithm on the catalog to search for strong and repeating signals, and we came out with 3,200 light curves. This also included every single eclipsing binary in the southern hemisphere. <laughs> so we, these were uh, inspected individually and vetted by myself, uh, Chelsea, and Jason Dittman, also at MIT. This resulted in 41 planet candidates and uh, 41 planet candidates around metal poor hosts. So this is just a, a really nice example of a light curve. You can see clearly transits here, here, here. And uh, once you make the phase folded light curve, once you stack all of those um, uh, transit events on top of one another, you actually get this really, nice, um, this really nice light curve, which I will talk a little bit about later. So because single transits can't be identified by an algorithm which is searching for multiple transits, uh, we also enlisted the help of Sol Rappaport team of amateur astronomers to go through all 28,000 light curves by eye, one by one, and they discovered seven more uh, planet candidates for us. Here's a nice example of a single transit that BLS would not have picked up. So our results are that we found 48 planet candidates below a metallicity of minus 0.5. And eight of these metallicities are actually lower than any value in the literature. This, is, this belongs to Captain Star, which has a metallicity of uh, minus 0 0.89. So we have eight stars below that limit. And we also have, very excitingly, we have two metallicities lower than the predicted core accretion floor, which is at minus 1.5. So we have two stars that are at a metallicity of minus 2.28 and minus 2.18. So at face value, surely some of these will turn out to be false positive, but at face value, this implies that the core accretion model is either not operating at low metallicity or that the floor is nuanced. And um, maybe we need to take into account more elements than iron when we think about the metallicity floor. Can you give us just an idea of why there is that limit associated with core accretions? It's one of the steps from pebbles to this and that that doesn't happen when you go below that. What's the um, we are not sure. We, we want to validate these planets first and then start to ask questions about but what's somebody, going on. Oh, is it just an empirical thing, or did somebody actually predict there should be a floor? So the, so the core accretion model does have a theoretical limit at minus 1.5. Is, is that because there's just insufficient dust? It has to do with it has to do with um, both the temperature of the disk and the amount of material in it. And um, that's, that's, that's not my field. I'm a metal four star person, but uh, that, that's what I understand to be the case. So we do have errors for all these metallicities. They're usually in the range of 0.1 to 0.2 dex. Um, we will be obtaining spectroscopic confirmation of all of these stars. And um, totally by serendipity, we just found this really great case of a single transit. It's the longest period planet candidate discovered in tests yet. Um, 
And so I've been working with Steven Villanueva and Sam Quinn to uh, sort of figure out what's going on here. And so according to their models, this is a Jupiter mass planet with a period of 1.33 years. So this is a Jupiter that's orbiting between the orbits of Earth and Mars. And it's really exciting because this could actually be a solar analog system at low metallicity. So this, this could have interior planets, it could have a Saturn, it could have, um, you know, it could closely resemble our solar system. So this is really something we're going to be keeping an eye on. Uh, oh, this is just a, um, a G star. It's around 5,500 to 6,000. Yeah, it's not an M dwarf. So what's next for us is vetting. Um, we're going to be using KELT as well as um, whatever NOAO has become, I forget the acronym now, uh, resources in the coming year. So we're going to be doing photometry to check for visual binaries and we're going to be doing uh, some non-precise radial velocity to deal with, um, to make sure that we're eliminating spectroscopic binaries. And then we will be getting uh, precision radial velocity measurements. We, have, uh, we got one night this semester to uh, study that candidate that I was talking about earlier with the nice light curve. So that was PI by Anna Frabel and Sarah Seeger. And then Joanna and I will be doing the hard work on it. And um, we will also be getting spectroscopic follow-up of all of our PC candidates, whether they turn out to be false positives or not, just to measure, um, to confirm that metallicity and also to measure elemental abundances of planetary building blocks like carbon, oxygen, silicon, that kind of stuff, so that we can begin to work with modelers to understand what these planets are made out of, um, how that is related to their host star, and things like that. Um, final disclaimer, it's likely that some of these candidates will turn out to be false positives, but that's okay. So many few, even, even if everything turns out to be a false positive, that still tells us something about the nature of planet formation. You know, maybe there is a metallicity floor that's higher than we thought it was. Um, you know, maybe all of our planets turn out to be actual planets and not just uh, false positive. And then, you know, maybe we have this crazy low uh, metallicity floor that we really need to look into. Maybe the disk instability model is operating there. Maybe it's, you know, some strange version of core accretion. Um, yeah, so in conclusion, metal poor stars are crucial for exploring the early universe, which now includes planet formation. Check out my recent papers for new metal poor stars, uh, the sixth ever measurement of uranium, an insight into accreted satellite masses. And uh, keep an eye out for seamstress and our 48 new planet candidates at metallicity is as low as minus 2.28, vetting, mass determination, and collaboration with modelers to come. Thank you. Any questions? Okay. You mentioned several times this well-propagated result that in the very early universe, uh, st uh, the stars are very massive. Yes. It, with what certainty is the IMF known, the initial mass function known, and how certain are people that you can't have, let's say, solar mass stars? Um, that's a great question, and it really comes entirely down to modeling and the fact that we have never found a first star. We, there are no stars with totally blank spectra. So just based on that one empirical piece of data and um, the results that come out of models when you apply only H2 cooling and no other cooling mechanism, predict an IS, uh, IMF that starts around like 40 solar masses and just sort of goes up to around several hundred. Mm -hmm. um, based on uh, the knowledge of uh, tests like curve systematics mm -hmm. and the magnitude of your physical targets, do you have an estimate of the smallest size planet that you could detect around these stars in your system? So the test noise floor um, mm -hmm. puts a limit of about one Earth mass. Um, so that is the smallest planet that we could possibly detect. We do actually have our, our lowest metallicity candidate is a Earth-sized planet, which means it is going to be very difficult to validate. But um, yeah, so that, that's the floor. So, suppose that a lot, a lot of most of the candidates from the low metal were transit were real. Yes. What does that tell you about the of metal for planets or metal for stars compared to 
Um, so that will be a great statistical question to answer once we have vetted all of our questions, or uh, once we've vetted all of our planets. Um, I, we can't really make that prediction yet. Um, we just kind of have to, we just have to find out through, through laborious science. We, we really don't know what the occurrence rate will turn out to be. Uh, for the higher military, Um, so we, well, we can do it for specific uh, kinds of exoplanets. So people have done studies on giant planets and found that they increase at uh, higher metallicities and they decrease toward lower metallicities and leave you with more like Neptune-sized planet. But that's, uh, again, that, that's just what we can do with uh, the current Kepler data. They are largely less than minus two, with uh, a handful that are more metal rich than that. Okay. Uh, second question. So, in order to do any of the statistics study, I think we need to understand the, uh, how to say the, the, uh, the selection function or whatever it's called. The point is, like, of these 48 uh, planets, my understanding is that they all have a host of with metallicity below minus. Uh, minus 0.5. Yes. But uh, I guess my question is, what is the completeness of stars in sky mapper, like like uh, co uh, uh, sky coverage, and uh, in certain magnitude cut you have here, uh, cross specialist test, like how complete it is for all the host stars with metallicity below 0.5. Yeah, that, that's a good question, and uh, in the future I'll be working with members of the test team, people who like really understand this, the, the completeness question, to sort of get, get a, a realistic idea of um, what kind of statistics we're looking at. You know, like it's so-and-so metallicity, how many stars have planet, that kind of stuff. It's, it's definitely something we're going to be looking at in the future, but it's not something I have an answer to right now. Oh, okay. You actually didn't get them because of your selection. Yeah, that is definitely possible. And um, currently, we're, we're getting spectroscopic measurements, so we can start to actually put together a function of, you know, if SkyMapper says, if it's this metallicity, but it's really this metallicity. So we're, we're getting spectra. But you are getting spectra from these 48. My question yes. is, you don't really know what you're missing. So, That's so true. There are work Um, I would have to get in touch with Ani about that. Any other questions?